All right, in three, two, and one. All right, welcome back to the Educators Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Alejandro Gutierrez, and I have a special guest today, as usual. Every time we drop an episode, I, I get some interesting people, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. That's the way I do it here. So go ahead, and introduce yourself, my man. <laughs> hey, thank you, Alex, for having me, man. So my name is Michael Benjamin II. Um, I am an educator, community advocate, uh, human capacity builder, right? Uh, born and raised in Sacramento's Oak Park uh, neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? Um, yep. Graduate of Sacramento High School um, and attended Sacramento City College, attended Howard University, and a graduate of Sac State University. Um, um, and, you know, I'm just uh, uh, someone who, you know, I'm a, I'm a resource, man. That's what it is, community resource, you know. Um, I feel like um, it's what's needed. We have a saying in a program that I work with in at Sacramento City College called RISE, which stands for Respect, Integrity, Self-Determination Through Education. And the saying is, I am resource. Meaning, once you become the resource, it's your responsibility to spread it. And so that's my whole goal. That's my whole life's ambition. I'm the founder of uh, SULA, S-U-L-A, which stands for Sacramento Urban Learning Academy. Under that academy, we have an initiative called Fades for Grades. And Fades for Grades looks to turn barbershops into mental health facilities by providing youth mental health first aid um, training to barbers. They then become certified. And then on the end, we have clinicians, which we refer the clients to. They come back for another haircut. So we create this circle of care uh, utilizing the barbershops, um, you know, throughout the area. Barbershops are unique because they're already having those conversations with people, right? Right. Barbershops right, right. is a place where, especially for uh, the Black community we meet, it's like our country club, if you will. <laughs> you get every resource you need in the barbershop. So basically what my goal is, is to put, um, you know, the resources in there, give what the barbers are seeing some context, right? So they're just not in there like, hey man, that dude's crazy. It's like, well, now that you got the training, tell me a little bit more. And they're able to say, oh, you know what? It looks like the beginning steps of anxiety or it looks like a little bit of PTSD. And then I can refer them to a health clinician on the back end who refers them back for another haircut. So that's where we at, man. Yeah. Man, okay. That's longest longest intro I've had on this show. So oh, hey, man. But, but but it's because you have a lot to tell. That, that's why I got you on here, man. So <laughs> um no man, this is cool. I, I met you uh with 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 our mutual friend Vincent. And yeah. right away I was like, man, this guy got energy. And I was like, I told Payne, I was like, hey man, uh, I'm gonna put him on the podcast. He goes, No, I'm gonna put him on mine first. I said, nah, man, like I you know, I already <laughs> called it. You, you know what I mean? So um, I like your energy. I like what you stand for. Yeah. Um, all the things you just talked about, we'll get into some of them and, and just, you know, I like, I like people that are doing things for others, you know, because like you said, you become a resource, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you become a resource. And once you learn something, it shouldn't stop right there. You're, now is your, now is your turn to pass that along to someone else. And then obviously, you know, do something with that, you know, information. So I like okay. that. I'm a teacher, you know, like I said, I'm a teacher right. and, um, it's obviously, I think, I know, I think you said your sister's a teacher. You have people in the family, the teachers. So, you know, you mm-hmm. kind of have, you know, your feet in there in the classroom as well. And you're helping the community. So you say you went to Sac High, you're from Oak Park and, and yeah. um, that's cool, man. I, you know, it, it's, uh, it's always cool to meet somebody that's in their community doing something from where they're from. You know what I mean? So that's why mm-hmm. I teach where I, where I grew up, you know, right. cause I feel like I understand, um, you know, I, I don't think I had many hardships, uh, probably none growing up, you know, Thank, thank God and thank my parents. But um, I, I obviously know people that I grew up with or people that I interacted with that could have went a different path if somebody would have reached out or something like that, you know? So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I appreciate you doing that. And I also appreciate your time joining me, man. So um, yeah. I, I know we talked before and you said you were doing your, you even had a little Facebook live that you would do, right? You would get on there and call people <laughs> out and, and talk to them, right? Yeah, yeah, a little something. I, it, it since uh, has kind of, um, I got I to gotta, I gotta revive it, but um. I started a, a podcast called uh, The People's Platform. Yeah. And basically what it is, is it's it's straight neighborhood politics, right? And I'm not talking about, a lot of times when we talk about neighborhood politics, you know, people uh, think we're talking about street politics, you know, violence, gangs, crime, things like that. But nah, we're talking about the politics of um, the neighborhoods that are either negative, negatively or positively, right, affecting the neighborhood and how we can navigate that. So resources, so for example, uh, I'm working in, um, I'm, um, I'm working out of the Fruit Bridge Collaborative. They have a diaper drive that we're doing, right? So we got, we got diapers, you know, free. So, so that's some of the politics that, uh, you know, we talk about some of the resources that can level, you know, some of the finances. We all know, if you got kids, you know, 
diapers are expensive. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Wipes and things like that. So um, the show is more about information sharing, right? Um, and so what we do is we, we basically give you the news, give you the politics through the lens of brown and black people, right? Because, you know, we, we how politics affects us different. Okay, we all know they like to use these terms trickle down, trickle down, very rarely trickles down to us. So we have to have the information so we can trickle up to it to the resources, get them, take them, and bring them back to our community. You know, on that uh what was that was that uh that app, that Robin Hood app, you know? Yeah. So yeah, you know, that's how we gotta do sometimes. Get together and beat the man. Yeah, I like that. No, I'm <laughs> with you, man. Um so kind of tell me why like why everybody has a why, right? Like why why dedicate your time to this? You know, we got people that dedicate their time you know, hooping or, or people there get the time to just working or their family or whatever. Why, why did you take so much time out of your day to, you know, fight for your community? You know, why, what is it that drives you to do that? Well, you know, what happens is that um, it's all about legacy building. And so someone took the time to do this for me, right, when I was a youth. I might have not known uh, who it was, but they did take the time. So it, it, it's it's now my time to give back. And actually, I know who it was in my neighborhood. We had a we had a, a lot, a lot of freedom fighters in my neighborhood growing up, you know. So, you know, we talk about um Callie Carney, right? Um, who was a a city councilwoman, you know, in my neighborhood. You talk about uh Harrison Crump, Norman Blackwell, Walter Beatty, uh Frank Bullard. You know, I got there's a lot of people in my neighborhood who, you know, look just like me and were fighting for me to have the right to uh, experience my neighborhood in a way that would grow me into a man. And that's what they did for me. And that's really cool. It's, it, it, it's, it's transformative, right? So I had the opportunity to um, experience that. And I think I know that it's my responsibility to give that back. See, the thing people don't understand is, is that, you know, my neighborhood ain't all bad. You know, it, it might be, the pictures might be painted by certain people as if it is, but my neighborhood, I got a lot out of my neighborhood that made me into the man that I am, a lot of good things. And so I want to highlight those things as well. Um, and so the great give back, uh, it's just in my heart to do it, right? Because I love it. You know, I love my neighborhood. I love the people in my neighborhood. Uh, I love what people, pro what the people provided me in my neighborhood. And so what it is, is art of storytelling. That's all basically it is. So I'm back retelling these stories of what made me um, want to be this way. And hopefully it'll inspire a youth to want to do the same thing, right? Right. So that's right. that's why I do it, man. Oh, man. No, I like that because that, <laughs> that exactly what it is. Legacy building is, is that's everything, right? Because we want to leave a legacy. What we we want to like, you know, we talked about it today with a couple of coworkers talking about, you know, people have to break that generational, you know, mm -hmm. uh, cycle whatever's going on in their life or whatever's going on in their house you know sometimes right now especially with the pandemic we see kids you know now it's almost over right we're almost we're in game seven we're getting close to you know getting out of this thing but you know because we went back to school this week you know so it oh, was okay. great yeah it was great to see kids you know with the little hybrid system half of the kids you know some kids stayed home but man the kids that were there man i mean i know they had a mask on but some of them were like super excited to see yeah familiar faces especially their teachers you know and I had a kid run up to me and I was like, no, back up, bro. Like, you know, we can't even, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, it, but, right. but you can just tell, you can see the energy like, man, they really want to be here um, because it's easy for a lot of people to say like, oh, well, people are at home. What's the problem? It's like, but what if home is not where some of these kids are, are you know, are right. going to have a safe space, you know, or even have a good situation. So, you know, the, sometimes the school is a safe haven for some of these, you know, um, youth. And so mm -hmm. when you say leave a legacy, we talked about that because some people, we got to just sometimes change what, what's what's going on or change the situation for the next kid that's coming up, you know, because it, we see a kid and, and we look at a kid, and we go, man, look at that guy, man, troublemaker. You know what I mean? We label mm -hmm. him and mm -hmm. it's easy to label us, you know, and I'm, I'm learning this as I'm doing uh, some extra units in college and I'm reading some more stuff and, and it's so easy for teachers to, and, and just adults, you know, put a label on a student like, oh, that's a troublemaker. And it's like, but do you know, do you really know the student though? Like, do you really know, mm -hmm. What he had to do to even get here today, or do you know mm -hmm. what he's been dealing with, or do you mm -hmm. know who he lives with? And and sometimes and obviously most of the time we don't, you know. So I, I don't know. Sometimes with this pandemic, I kind of sat down and reflected, and I was like, you know what? Like every child here, man, deserves they, they deserve more than one chance, you know. And so we have to find a way, you know, to to get the best out of them while we do have them, because the second they leave our schools, you know, what I mean, it's gonna be really hard to keep 
keep tabs on these on these children. So mm-hmm. I really like that you're doing that. And and you know, I think that's probably one of our leg one of my legacies that I want to leave is being able to be that cool teacher that, you know, I maybe maybe I never had you in my classroom, or maybe you didn't like my class at all, but you're gonna know that 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 teacher showed me respect. He built me up and he talked to me about how life's gonna be, you know. So no um, doubt. That, that's something that I growing up, you know, I saw my I saw that in my dad. You know, my dad was an educator as well. And to me, like man, we go to Chuck E. Cheese and some of his old students were there, like, hey, Mr. G, and they'll hook us up with tokens, you know. And so to me, it's like, wow, my dad's the cool guy that they're giving yeah. free tokens to. So yeah, to me, that was like, man, you know, not every not every kid can say that their dad or their mom uh affected, you know, hundreds of lives, you know, like that. So that to me, that's a I don't know, that's that's something that I'm I see, I'm grasping it, and I hopefully I could leave that behind, you know, as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what happens is I have to tell educators and my educators that, you know, if you're not going to um, if you're not going to uh, water and take care of the garden, then you can't complain about what it produces. Mm. Right. So in other words, don't you know, we'd like to look at these kids and go, oh, my God, look at these kids, these kids, these kids. But you have to then take a look at yourself and say, you know, how well did you plant that seed? How well did you water that seed? How well did you take care of that seed, right? Before you start to complain. And so what happens is education, a lot of time, it doesn't leave space for, um, you know, the social things that school needs to present. And so for uh, for black kids, especially, man, it's like, you know, you're already in a system that is, you know, systemically uh, uh, not really there for you, right? You're not learning none of your history, right? You're not learning anything that's relevant. So you could take back, you know what I'm saying, to your neighborhood. And so what has to happen is, is that, you know, the cultivation of that seed has to be tended to, right? And if it's not tended to, then you can't complain. If you're not tending to that seed, that's why the saying I am resource, right? Because if we all say that and we all tend to the to the garden and we get the desired product out of it, then we all going to be cool. Everybody benefits from a, you know, an employed and an educated community. We all do. So it's everybody's responsibility can't get to pointing fingers and that's what happens in education a lot and with you know some adults is they get to pointing the finger right but the finger needs to point right back at themselves because you have the ability to impact like your father did right see that's a that's see for you me and your father those are wins right when you're somewhere i know you got the feeling too you somewhere and somebody's like yo it was <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You're like, yo, like, what's up? And especially if you haven't seen them in a long time, you're like, yeah. what are the odds? I'll tell you a funny story is, you know, I, I still, man, I'm in the streets like the yellow lines, man. So I'm in my hood, man. I don't, you know, I ain't <laughs> going nowhere. Uh, I'm at one of the local stores, corner stores, and I got my mask on. And I'm going in the store and a kid that I haven't seen in seven years, right? And I was working at a, a court and community school. So, you know, these kids all had, labels and fit tags and things like that. But he was one of my more hard to deal with, but I broke through, you know what I'm saying? Being able to give him the shared experiences that we both come from, you know what I'm saying? Areas where, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's a, a little rough. And he seen me with the mask on and was like, yo, Mr. B. And I was like, <laughs> what? I didn't remember his name. He was like, it's me, Tay. And I was like, whoa. So we started talking and he shared with me. He said, Mr. B, I appreciate you. He said, I'm a solar electrician. I said, what? He's like, yeah, man, I'm a solar electrician, Mr. B. And I, I, I want to thank you. And see, those, you know, no money, no, no Angela. It's just that right there. That's enough, right? Yeah. What that lets me know is the little bit of water I might have had in my cup, I was able to pour on him as a seed, and he was able to grow. And I'm like, man, I was just, so he, take my number down, Mr. B. Listen, and I was like, hey. I need for you to talk to some youth, you know, to let them know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Where you're coming from, right? Because sometimes trauma, trauma needs to hear trauma, right? So you, you know, if, if, if someone who's going through something traumatic, right, hears someone else who went through something traumatic and how they got out of it, that's the map right there. You know, and it comes from a peer group. It has to come from a peer. And so I'm putting him on my little speakers, you know, my little uh, roller decks of speakers coming up. Uh, and, that, and you just said that now they become a resource for the next generation coming up. And like you said, they're a little, a testimony, right? These businesses use yeah. testimonies and, and it's a little network that you're building. And I think, you know, I go back to that Tupac quote, you know, it's like, you know, uh, Rose in the, you know, was it Rose in the concrete? So, you yeah. know, he talks about, Rose you know, like, from the concrete, yeah, right? Rose, yeah, right. grew from the concrete. So 
to me, it was like, man, that was huge because it's, it's talking about, you know, we build up these kids and, you know, the ones that do get through, right? The ones that do get through, but, but, you know, let's just say we get a doctor out of these kids. Okay. All right, cool. We got a doctor, but then that doctor, you know, he ends up moving to the, you know, to the burbs and now he's not, you know, now yeah. he's not back in the trenches over here <laughs> and trying to find more doctors, you know? So I feel like, mm-hmm. you know, yes, we want to make it. And yes, you know, people want to, want to build that thing. Hey, you gotta get out of here. Right. But it's like, it's not just to get out of here. It's you got to be that resource now and bring it back, you know, so that we can continue to bring people out of here and, 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 mm-hmm. you know, change the way people look at, you said, like they look at Oak Park, you know, um, we, we only know a negative view, you know, from the outside, you know, cause I'm not from, you know, that area, you know, so people at like, Oak Park, you're like, what? you know what I mean? So like, that's the only view we have, but if people know the history of Sacramento, you know, Oak Park, you can tell it better, right? Oak Park was the first suburb, right? You know, of, of Sacramento, right? The, you know, Broadway, right? Broadway was the first, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you would say, quote unquote, what they like to say, nice neighborhoods, you know, and then obviously <laughs> things change, right? Things change. And, and so kind of talk about that a little bit. I mean, you know, you know more history about that. So, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of talk about the changes because the other day yeah. I went, man, and, uh, you know, I went to get a coffee. It looked a little bit different, man. Yeah, man. So, <laughs> so, so what's funny is that, uh, Later on this evening, I have a. Um, they're gonna they're gonna announce the community benefits agreement that uh, Aggie Square hmm. is trying to present to us. Um, you know the the word is and it is it's called gentrification, man. And um, you know it's the um, it's the systemic uh, removing or displacing right of people um, who are indigenous to this to that area, right? Okay. Who and what I mean by that is, you know, indigenous to the struggle. What, one of the biggest things that people understand is um, uh, signals of, of, of gentrification are highways or freeways. See, there was a time when um, Stockton Boulevard was the main freeway that came into Sacramento. Okay. After they built 99, people were able to then move out to more rural parts of, of Sacramento, right? Elk Grove, you know, and out, out north. And that left uh, that neighborhood dilapidated, right? And that's when, you know, we, you know, brown and black people moved in there to, to have, uh, to live in Oak Park. And, you know, we're talking, you know, uh, 40s, 50s, 60s. Okay. And, you know, disenchanted, they left it, you know, and left it for dead. And we moved in and, you know, kept it afloat, uh, kept it relevant, kept it cool, kept it hip, you know, and what happens, what you see in gentrification is, people start to realize like, hey, we miss the diversity of living, right? We don't want to ride out to a track home where all the homes look the same. We want a little bit of personality in where we live, right? Also, it's near um, downtown, right? So Downtown's you know, it's, popping it's, now. Yeah. Downtown's popping now, right? You notice how that happened, that development, you know, downtown and then all the areas around downtown started to grow. Um, what we're experiencing right now is, um, uh, the UC Regents are proposing uh, building a, a five billion dollar uh, structure on the corner of Stockton and, and Broadway, right? right? That'll go back towards 65th, and, and um, you know the people in the community, like myself, we're fearful that this will cause displacement, right? So it's development with displacement. What we need is development without displacement, and um, we're not seeing that because what happens is that people like that can come in and talk directly to our uh, elected officials <laughs> and get certain things passed without, uh, you know, getting of the community. So tonight, they're supposed to present a community um, benefits agreement uh, that will guarantee that uh, the neighborhood won't uh, outprice the people who are already there. Um, mm, right. It's sad. I mean, you're seeing um, uh, more uh, closely tied to that is CV Circle. There's a community called CV Circle and New Helvetia, which is on the um, the uh, far west side of Broadway before you get to Miller Park. Um, and there's 750 families who will be displaced out of that housing uh, project facility. I don't know, um, I know exactly where it is. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because a developer came in and it's, it's you, just to see how gentrification works. If anyone listening to this podcast wants to see how gentrification works, go down to Broadway and Fifth, make a left. You're going to see $400,000 homes that are neighboring and bordering uh, uh, housing projects. So when you ask yourself, who has to go, right? Who has to go? And it's going to be those 750 families that are uprooted from that area. So someone can put some waterfront property there and 
sell high priced condos. That's wrong. That is completely wrong. People have been there for 30 years. You can't just uproot people and because a developer comes in and decides to, you know, um, wants that wants to build there. Yeah. The question becomes, where do these people go, right? Because these people have built culture. They've built families. They've built, this is where they're from, you yeah. know? And in an instant, they got to go, you know? And so these are some of the things that we're facing. Um, it's really a fight for me because it's mostly um, brown and black people, black people that are facing this. I mean, it doesn't affect others, right? And it comes without an apology, man. It's just like, yo, this is what it is. See you later. Yeah. Uh, Hunter's Point is going through it, parts of Oakland. So I was gonna yeah. say, I was gonna say, there's a bunch of. It's kind of a hot topic, right? I mean, I never heard of that word. Maybe within the last five years, right? It started. I started hearing it, gentrification, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's definitely going on in all the major cities, right? In the United mm -hmm. States for sure. But what do you think would be like a alternative? Because I know you say like, okay, we need development without displacement. I'm, you know, and I'm and I'm with you. So how do you get these investors to come in and develop a place without displacing, you know, a lower income community? How do you do that? Because obviously for change, right? Because they, they're looking at, like you said, they're looking at some land. It's like, and this is cheaper than somewhere else, or this is a hot spot we want to mm -hmm. be at. Mm -hmm. How do you get someone to come and invest in those communities so that you don't kick out the people that are there? How, how would you do that? I mean, what's the alternative? So, so the, the alternative is, is that, um, you know, the, the problem is, is this, man, is that um, we deindustrialized like the cities, right? So all your uh, canneries and things like that where people yeah. would work yeah. that um, might not have degrees and things like that, all that's been pushed out, right? All that's been outsourced. So what happens is, is that it makes the living spaces only affordable to those who have, um, you know, advanced degrees. And we know who has the least of those, right? Yeah. So what happens is, is that the desirable living spaces become minimal for, for black people, right? So basically what happens is, is that what needs to happen is, is that when you come in and you want to develop, you need to also come in and develop uh, employment as well. That needs to be a part of the plan. If, you know, these rents are going to rise, then you need to be the main advocate for a, a, a uptick in um, minimum wage, right? So you're not outpricing these people because that's what happens basically you come in you build up you know you build some condos they're selling at four hundred thousand. you have housing projects next to it right and just by sheer um you know just by sheer whatever you have to raise the prices right and and that's what goes on so what has to happen is is that the development has to come with a community benefits agreement that says hey you know what we're going to look to create uh, uh opportunities for employment of the people who are already here. So if we do decide to raise rents, they'll be able to afford it as well. Okay. You know, something like that. That's a, you know, that's a fix. Um, and then, you know, it just needs the, the city needs to come to a space and place where they demand and command that they keep rates, rental rates, um, affordable. You know, and and so what happens is that a lot of people understand is that they they use this formula um to calculate uh called an AMI, it's average medium income. Okay. Median income. And that's how they determine what affordable housing is. So right now I'm in a battle. I'm in my myself and, and, and a group of us, we're in a battle with the city because we're saying, okay, they're saying, well, we're gonna their their quote unquote what they call affordable housing, um, you know, they're gonna calculate the AMI. But my question is, are you gonna do the AMI now or are you gonna wait till Aggie Square is built and do the AMI, right? Mm. It's gonna look different. Because you have doctors and nurse practitioners and and LBNs and all, see that they're, they're the AMI the average median income for them is a little let, let's say a little bit higher than what it is now right um, with the working folks that live in those communities now and that's some of the semantics some of the words that they you know average you know uh, uh, affordable housing what does that look like please define that and they, they never have a definition for it so um, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely like a, it's like a, you know, it comes, it comes full circle, right? Because, you know, downtown used to be quote unquote, you know, the slums, right? So, right. right? And then they took, they tore that down. Uh, <laughs> so it could be the Capitol Mall, right? Where we have all the nice, you know, buildings right. and then we have Capitol. Right. And then, and then they took that to, you know, Del Paso Heights, right? Where right. Del Paso Heights used to be, just like you said, Broadway it used to be the spot, you know, that 
that Del Paso Boulevard was the spot. You know, they call that what Uptown or whatever. So, uh-huh. you know, and it was because I watched the whole YouTube thing on it. it was the whole like you yeah. know historic <laughs> historic route, right? They would go from there uh-huh. all the way up, right? There was no mm-hmm. eighty. There was no eighty mm-hmm. freeway. So kind of no like you said, freeway. kind of like you said over here. Once they made the freeway. Um, you mm-hmm. can just bypass that and nobody would go through Del Paso Boulevard to these businesses. So that's why it was kind of a ghost town for a while. Mm-hmm. It's, it's coming up a little bit. It has a little bit of the hipster vibe. You know, they're bringing in a couple of things here and there. Um, so it just comes full circle. You know, if it's one, if it's not this neighborhood, it's going to be the next one. And then the next oh, one. Yeah. And then until so they create, you know, like you said, it's, it's cheaper land or it's a hot spot they want to be in. They want to f- associate themselves next to downtown. You mm-hmm. know, you see what's going on in West Sac. You know, mm. next to the river where there was Ooh, nothing before. Yeah. There was nothing but there was nothing. And now condos and houses are like, well, that costs a lot of money. And it's like, because it's only like you're a three minute walk from downtown. You know, it's it's a yeah. great spot to be in. And it's Yolo County. So that yeah. changes the whole game. You know, you're everything changes when you're a different, you know, there's a different county. So that, yeah. that's crazy, man. It's a it's like a never ending fight, right? It is. I don't even recognize Broderick no more. Broderick and Broderick, I don't even. I don't even recognize Broderick no more. I'm like, man, what is this? What is going on over here? But let me say this, it's it's they're not, you know, historically, I had to talk to somebody today about that, about gentrification, and she was super upset. I had to tell her, like, listen, historically, um, the United States of America is built on gentrification. Think about it. When you defined it, I was thinking of the entire, I was yeah. thinking about the foundation of this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. It, that, that's what it is, right? When, when those, those pilgrims or whatever you want to call them landed on the, you know, the coast, you know, the, I mean, they gentrified that area, right? They moved in, moved the natives out, right? Kept moving. It's I think it's John Locke uh, was the famous, uh, you know, white um, uh, writer who said, you know, manif- he called it manifest destiny, which which meant westward expansion, right? And it was a way to kind of um, okay that west that westward expansion, no matter what it took, right? We're gonna expand west, even if we gotta displace these people off their land, we're going to expand West. And so you see these attitudes, right, that that prevail today. Same thing, right? It's expansion at all costs. And um, so, you know, it's not surprising, right, because this is how this country was founded on gentrification. So um, it just hits home when you see it in your own neighborhood. And, and gentrification is not just the physical displacement of the people in the community. It's the spiritual, cultural, right? And, and relevant displacement of the people in the community. Because now you got people coming in, you know, uh, erasing um, history and culture, right? Taking the names down to things and putting some other name up, right? And you're going in there and you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, this used to be this, and, and, and it meant this, right? And we need to keep that level of relevance. It's our history, we made it, it's ours, and you can't just come in, take it down, destroy it we can't do that and I, I just i don't even know like a solution to it you know we're just talking about you know you for a billionaire to come in you know if i'm a billionaire i need to invest somewhere i'm gonna look wherever i want to be but mm-hmm. you know sometimes you don't take that into consideration the people who are there like, you're just thinking yeah man they're gonna be out this is my spot i'm paying for this so i'm gonna get this <laughs> in so what do you think is a challenge for these elected officials that you have in the neighborhood or in, the, in that area what kind of challenges are they facing you know because obviously they have to voice the community, but how, you know, how do they, you know, I don't know. They also have to keep their relationships going. So what do you think? What, what kind of challenges do you think they face? I mean, it's tough. I mean, you, you know, depending on the policy, the, depending on the elected official, uh, it can be tough. Um, what I find is, is that if the elected official is really for the people, then yeah, it's going to be a tough conversation. But if the elected official is not, it's the easiest conversation ever. It's like, come on in, develop, you're good. Don't worry about it. I'll, you know, I'll run interference with the community and go ahead and start building, right? And that's what we're facing, right? We're facing that if you're a good elected official and if you're an elected official that got the people in mind, then yeah, it's going to be some stoppages because you're like, wait a minute, let me check with my people first. Let me see what, you know what I'm saying, my constituents are saying. Let me go and take a survey of this, this uh, demographic in the neighborhood, whether it be, you know, an ethnic uh, a demographic, whether it be a, a demographic that's on age, you know, people who want to see more resource, whatever it is, you can gather that information as an elected official and take it back to developers and say, okay, listen, we understand you want to develop, that's fine, but here's what the people are asking for. Here's what the people want to see this look like, right? But if you're not, if if if, if your office is, you know, like whatever, then it becomes easy. 
And that's where gentrification comes in, right? When there's no oversight, when there's no, when you can just come in with the money, right? Then that's what gentrification happens. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing um, it's a hostile takeover. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing a hostile takeover. And, and, and I see a couple, yeah. I see a couple of things with that. Like um, one would be educate. It goes back to education, man. Number yeah. one is, is we have to, uh, you know, get in touch with these students when they're young, teach them how some of these things work so that when they become older, obviously they can get involved and in maybe into politics. You know, cause I think a lot of things like, Oh, look at what happened. It's like, yeah, you know what though? Like, yeah, we do have, cause I think this year it was last year, 2020. Um, it was the, the first time that, you know, it was the most Latinos ever that were accepted to UCs, you know, University of California. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'm like, we're talking about in California, man. They used to be making In California. Yeah, but, right? you know, okay, whatever, right? So you, you and I both know. So I'm like, okay, this is the first time, which is like, that's good. Because I do know a lot of Mexican-Americans or Mexicans or Latinos, Salvadorian, whatever, you know, Hondureños, people from, Latin, you know, Latino descent that do go to college and do get degrees. I've seen them. We see them in the classrooms, right? We do see people color in the classrooms. But I think there's one more step now. I think we need to see people of color in politics. You know, yes. I, I think we can keep saying it like, oh, it's cool, man, because there's already a big level of us in education. You know, you, you'll see them everywhere in different spots. But now it needs to be, you know, a little bit more. You know, we need to be we need to be on the board. We need to be on these boards. We need to be on these committees, you know, and so that, like you said, people that are from the community can actually fight for anything that's for them. You know, and I just think that's one thing that we're missing is, is that disconnect between you know, a lot, I think a lot of times we, we shoot for being doctors or we shoot for being mm-hmm. ball players or whatever it may be, but we forget that there's a little another level of power that we're forgetting. And I think the people of color were definitely, you know, we're missing that. And and I was, uh, you know, when this whole thing was going on last year with the official, you know, with the uh, election, sorry, it was a rough time for all of us, right? It was really, it was a rough time. There was the, the pandemic, you know, George Floyd situation, a bunch of things that were going on. And then obviously the election, right? It was the, one of the roughest years probably in history right in this country and you know the one thing i kept thinking about was you know malcolm 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 sorry malcolm x was talking about before that you know the black person you know the 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 black the black kids look up to celebrities that's all they ever be able that's all they're able to look that's all they're able to ever look up to you know they look up to they'll they'll see an athlete they'll see a singer a rapper whatever maybe an actor but they never can able they can never look up and be like oh that's my president now they can't right you know now we have you know, what a couple, a couple of things, but it's not enough, you know, for these kids to grow up and see people that look like them in situations and in positions of power. No, you're right. And, and so <laughs> it's funny because I have this conversation with the black community all the time, which is white America will always, always, always allow us to entertain them. Always. They're never going to take that away from us. If we can dunk a ball, if we can rap, <laughs> If we can dance, if we can, they're never going to take that away. And so what happens is, is that they do make them the uh, the spokespeople for um, for African Americans and Black people. And the problem with that is, is that they have neither the training, nor education, nor historical context to speak on the behalf of right. Right. Black people. They don't, right? And so that becomes the problem. And you're right. We need more leaders at a base level, right? who are pushing um, initiatives that will serve the community as a whole, as opposed to, because the thing about the entertainment thing is that they're still under the control, right? Of whatever company, whatever, you know, ask Nick Cannon, right? You, you, you know, you're still under the control, right? Your voice is still under control of whoever's paying you. And that's the problem. And they control the messaging. Malcolm also has a, 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 a quote on um, media and how media controls, you know, the thought process. See, the difference between the generations is, is that our generation was taught to create thought and this generation is given their thoughts. So there's a difference there, right? Through all the social media, they're giving exactly what they should think. Where we were taught like, yo, develop thought. How does this feel to you, right? Mm-hmm. It was all on feel. Now it's not on feel. It's how many how many likes, right? Um, and things like that. And, and that's where it becomes dangerous. Um, for uh, um, black kids and, and brown kids, because we know that uh, who's controlling that messaging, and 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 you, and you got to be very careful with that. And um, that's what it is. Like I, I'm laughing as an educator because, I, man, I don't know about you, but I'm trying to figure out who is going to write the 2020 
uh, chapter in the history books, man. Because when we get the history back from <laughs> McGraw Hill, I wonder, like, I just want to read, before I teach it, I'm going to have to read it to see what they said about 2020, man. Yeah, you man. Know? Definitely, the narrative is definitely, they're trying to change the narrative. We're trying, people, we are trying to change the narrative. You know, I think uh, we're, we're starting to question everything, you know, and that's a, that's a good thing. You know, yeah. sometimes it becomes a little too much. We're questioning a little bit too much, but hey, you know, it's, it's okay for people to voice their opinion and, and be upset with something or, you know, and, and, you know, it becomes an ugly situation. We saw what happened last year and, you know, it's not a, this is not a political podcast or anything like that, but obviously these things come up because this is what we, we live with, you know, but definitely the whole situation going on, people were uptight, you know, and the pandemic was hitting us hard and, and it wasn't, obviously it was never, it wasn't good to see anything like that on video. And so that wasn't a good thing. You know, you know, so then people, you know, make, they make their comments and, and it's easy to make a comment on social media, you know, keyboard warriors, we call them, right. <laughs> people can type whatever they want. And it's like, that's fine, bro. Like that doesn't mean anything to me. And, but at the same time, we could also advocate online. Well, what does that right. really do? What does that really do? You know, right. I, I can, I, you can share all the posts you want, but if you're not, you know, connecting back to your community and trying to do something for it, then, then that's that's a blanket statement as well to me. Yeah, and I'm and, one of them too. I'm not calling people out because I'm part of that too. You know, so I agree. No, I have no problem calling people out, but I'm just saying that. And you're right about that. You know, what I'm saying works without action is nothing. Like you, you can, you know, you can post all you want. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I mean, what does that do if you're not actually taking the action? And that's why I was talking about watering that seed. You can, once the product comes, you know, if you don't like the product, you can't complain if you weren't out there watering the seed. Right. You weren't out there watering the seed, making sure that seed was growing properly and it grew into a plant that was fruitful and grew, then don't complain. And that's what happens a lot of times, right? People, the internet is, <laughs> it's hilarious because it a lot of time gives voice to people who shouldn't have a voice. Yeah. And if you didn't have a voice before the internet, then you don't need one now. You know what I'm saying? And I'm saying that to say, you know, people need to be careful about, you know, posting um, that. I, I tend to try to function in facts and facts only. You know, I, I don't, the, the kind of the emotional side of thing, it, it kind of sometimes can be distracting, right? And um, it can be very one sided, you know, and things like that. I try to function in facts. And, um, there's some spaces and places, but I think what it does too is I like it because what it also does is it opens up uh, channels to information that you and I didn't have. You know, I was in my office the other day and we had thesaurus and it, I was in there working with a kid. He was like, what is it? I was like, yo, that, <laughs> that right there is the internet when I was a kid. If I need to look something up, I went to the thesaurus. They, they remember, that, remember that? Our teacher would say, I need you to use a different word for this. You'd be like, <laughs> Or, you know what I mean? Like, yes. Yeah, or the encyclopedia, we need the Britannica, you know what I mean? It's like, hey, look up this, yes. whatever. And you go back and look it up. And and uh, no, you're right, man. The, 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 it's <laughs> obviously evolved the way that the, we're able to be connected way faster, way quicker with people that we probably Ooh. shouldn't or sometimes. I mean, we're on this podcast now. You know what I mean? So we're able True. to connect on this. And, and then, you know, at the, at the click of a button, I'm going to be able to post this and um, I'm going to have 200, 300 listeners, you know, listen to this. So that's obviously something that you and I couldn't do as kids, you know. I could record this on a tape and it would take forever for, you know, whatever. I would even look like, I'm like, how could I have done this before? You know, I used to mess around with my brother. We would, we would get those blank tapes, you know, the cassettes, uh -huh. and we would pretend to have a radio show, whatever. And, yeah. and, and that was the thing. Or you wait for your song to come on the radio and then you had to hit hey. record quick because you hey. want to get that, that track on there. And, hey, um, hey, it was the TDK fun. tapes, baby. The TDK tapes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> get you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you actually record over the last song. Man, you got to <laughs> rewind all the way, man. So um, it's definitely, Right. Uh, this new generation has more information at their yes. fingertips. Now it's can can they find a way to filter it out and understand what's real, what's yeah. not, and what's what's the narrative behind that? See, yeah. Uh, yeah. What I like about yeah. right now is that we got we're getting we're getting rid of what they call gatekeepers, right? So, for instance, if I want to be a big time, I was talking to you know Vincent about this. If I want to be a big time sports journalist, I could literally do this from my bedroom mm -hmm. forever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When back in the day, I'd have to wait for myself to, you know, go to school, maybe finish a degree doing this, make a connection, go work for the SAC B, you know, maybe the SAC B will let me get into KCRA and then KCRA, I'm on there for a little bit and then maybe ESPN will see me. It's a, it takes years and connections and people to get there. Mm -hmm. When now, mm -hmm. you know, I could start, I could essentially start my own ESPN from my room if I really wanted to, you know, so yeah. it's really up to these no kids. Can they, can we find a way to teach them? So they understand what's real, what's not, and, and who's trying to 
tell them something, you know? Yeah, no, no. I, I agree. Hey, shout out to Vince, Vince Payne. What's up, V? Yeah, so, but but listen, I think what happens is that it's good, it's, it's good, it, it, you know, it's always two sides to everything. Yeah. And, I, and so, I admire the accessibility, right? I always tell the students, like, oh, you guys got, man, you got, if you, do you know if I had a, 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 a program where I can put math formulas in it and they gave me the answer, man, yeah. man yeah, yeah, I'll yeah, probably yeah. have a doctorate by now. You know, but at the same time, the level of accessibility and the level of E, I think creates a little bit of uh, uh, laziness, right? And a little bit of entitlement. Because mm. what happens is that, yes, you can do a sports cast from your bedroom now, but it still will be relevant because you actually love and have studied sports, right? And that's the 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 that's what happened with us growing up. There were there were levels, there were proving grounds, right? There were um, rites of passages that you had to go to earn your spot, right? And what happens now is a lot of youth they don't have to earn a spot because you can become instantly, you know, famous, and so. I like, like you said, it's, it's good on both ends, right? Because it's good because you have all this access to information. I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, man, I'm jealous. You guys can just do everything, right? Um, and then on the flip side, it sometimes makes it too easy, right? And my dad has a saying, which is work never stops. Work never stops. In my household, we sleep. Sleep is work in my household. We sleep so we can get up and work, right? So, I mean... We don't want to lose that part of it, right? We don't want to lose that. The rigors still needs to have relevance, right? The rigors of what you're doing still has to have some type of relevance. You know what I'm saying? And so I think it's good. It's, it's two-sided, man, you know? It is. I think uh, I think we're seeing people that you said wouldn't have been famous before because we would never see them, right, on TikTok, whatever, maybe. They never see these people, yeah. YouTubers. And it's okay. People do make it. But the thing is now – you know, there's a false narrative that, you know, I'll be 16, I'll start a YouTube channel, I'll be famous tomorrow. And it's like, but, the, you know, first of all, there's only a couple people that could do that. And number two, you know, like you said, you got to know what you're doing as far as like, okay, you want to be a makeup tutorial, right? You, people, there's just levels to everything, right? There's, there's levels, levels to everything. And, <laughs> yeah. and so, you know, I, I'm totally with you. It's like the music, right? So yeah. there's a lot of people, there's a lot of young kids that I run into and they're, they're really into music. And I, I tell them, and I'm never going to be the guy to, to, to bring them down because, you, don't, you, you never know how you affect a student with any mm. comment you make. You know, your comment mm. could be just messing around and they just take it like, oh, this, you know, I suck. I'm done, you know, or or you say something, you know, uplifting and that could that could last forever. You know, something like, hey, you know, because I remember I had a teacher and my math teacher, I, I wanted to be an architect, right? Middle school, I was still on that and I was good at math. And and I remember her saying like, why would you do that? You don't make that much money doing that. And, and that little comment, now that I look back, it's like, man, that really took me away from even caring about that math class anymore, to be honest. And it was like, you, you know, little comments, like you gotta be careful what you say around yeah, you these, do. Young, these young sponges. So when I get these kids that want to get into music, all I ever ask them is just some critical thinking questions. Like, all right, you know, let me listen to your track. You know, I'm not a rap master. I don't know everything, but I want to know what you're, what you're saying. You know? So I listen to it. Oh, that's cool, man. You can see these kids, man, they lay the beat down. They drop the track. They're on SoundCloud. Right. And shout out to them if they're listening to this. You know, it's it's big time that they're already doing that. I'm jealous. Like, man, if I was in ninth grade dropping, you know, dropping rhymes on SoundCloud, you know, if we even had that, you know, that'd be crazy to have something like that. And mm -hmm. now the thing is, what are you going to do next? You know, what I mean, we're not all little Mozzie. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not Mozzie. What can we do next after that? You know, what I mean, what can we do? You know, is your music going to, you know, affect the community? Are, are people going to get behind it? I mean, you know, obviously it's easy for everyone to just push out music now, but that becomes, there's a problem to that now, right? There's too much music for us to listen to, right? So now where do the listens come from, right? If you don't want to be on the radio and we don't listen to the radio, how do how do you get that track in someone's ear? You know what I mean? So there's a lot of things I try to tell them, like, you know, things like that. Yeah, so I, I've been in the music, music industry for true 20 years. And I don't rhyme. I didn't I know that. Make, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, cool. don't, I don't rhyme. I don't make beats. I just do the business side of it. Mm. I just do the management side of it, booking, you know. Uh, a and R, you know, things like that, artist developer, that type of thing. And nice. so, you know, the reality of the situation is, is that, uh, you know, Mozzie works hard. Like he, he works on his craft, believe it. You know what I'm saying? He, he came up, you know what I'm saying, working on his craft. And so now he's at the part where the fruits, right? He, he yeah. planted that seed and watered it. Now it's starting to be fruitful. But what I tell them is, I say, and it's a good conversation you were having, which is there's so many different things you can do 
in the music and arts industry. You know what I'm saying? And in fact, the artists don't even make the most money, right? I mean, if you want to look at it, they're, they're, they're promoted as if they are, but they're not. Try being the guy who can mix down the music, right? He's the guy who makes the most money. When you make that track, it's rough. You can't put it on the radio because there's still stuff, you know, there's air in the tracks and it needs to be compressed properly and you need to bring this up and this level up. You are, if you become that guy who can level up and EQ that music and, 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 and uh, mix down that music, you're gonna make all the money. Dre has a guy that he used, Dr. Dre, white guy, right? Uh, I know his name is Brian Bass. I can't remember his last name, but he's the guy who mixes down all your favorite songs. All your favorite Dr. Dre songs, this guy mixes them down. So Dre might make the track, Snoop might rhyme on it, but you can't play it until this guy mixes it down. He's gonna make the most money, right? And there's an uh, entertainment lawyer. You know, you know right. with the way these artists are, they all need lawyers. So imagine if you're the entertainment lawyer, right? Imagine if you're, you know, the record executive, right? The label executive, okay? Those types of things, there's different, uh, 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 there's different positions inside of art and music that right. you can look at outside of being the, the, the rapper or the singer or whatever. So that's how I always encourage them. Um, Cause like you said, you don't want to discourage them. If music is what they love and what they want to be around, you just introduce them to the different parts. Of yeah, I'm just trying to open it up a little more. Like, okay, yeah. it's not just rapping, man, but there's like, yeah. there's a lot more you got to do. And, and and I think also, it's like for anything, if, if a kid comes up to you and says, hey, I want to go to the NFL. And you're like, okay, what do you play? Like, oh, I don't play. It's like, mm, you know what I mean? So yeah. you, you kind of want to break it to them like, hey man, if you're not playing right now at this age, yeah, you're going to have to already start it yesterday. You know what I mean? So there's like, you know, you're, you're trying to be that figure that maybe at home, they don't have that person to talk to about that. And maybe that's why they're approaching you about that, you know, because I had those conversations with my dad. I want to do this. And he would, he would never say no. He would be like, Hey man, okay, you got to do this, this and that. And I would kind of like, Oh, that's too much. Or I would just slide to something else, you know, but at least, you know, you have someone to talk to about that. I think a lot of times these young kids, they want to share that dream with someone. And there's someone there like, man, stop, man, I got time for this. You know, I gotta go work or whatever it may be. So if they reach out to you and you're a teacher or you're someone around them, just listen to them. You know what I mean? And, and, and don't shy them away from just kind of give them a little bit of cool feedback, but don't lie to them either. Because I feel like sometimes if we lie to them as well, Oh man, you're going to be the best. It's like, Hey man, like I think at the same time, you have to kind of like also tell them, Hey, you know, how about you cuss a little bit less, man? You, you know, because I can't even play this music around my family or whatever. I don't know, whatever a little feedback you can give them. No, no, it's true. And, and one of the biggest lies that people, tell uh, kids growing up in the United States of America is that you can be whatever you want to be. I hate when they do that. What you can be is whatever you're good at. Be. Okay. But you can't be whatever you want to be, right? And, and, and the reason I say that is because what happens is that you, it, it goes to your point, which is if you, you, know, you want to be a, a, a doctor, but you're not willing to put the time in to study math. Yeah, you can't be a doctor. Yeah. You can't be a doctor. <laughs> no. So it's, you can't, so you, you so so I tell them, you can be whatever you're good at. And so what happens after that is we start to have the conversation about, hey, what is it you like? What is it you want to go into? And then once I get that conversation going, we're able to then identify possible career paths, right? But we tell the kids, I'm always told that you can be whatever you want to be. And what happens is I spend a lot of time trying to <laughs> be something that I wasn't going to ever, you know, I should have been told, you know, I should, they should say, hey, we noticed that you're good at this. You know, we noticed that you're a kinesthetic learner. You work good with your hands or you, you know, you have a, a niche for teaching. Right. Um, you should consider being a teacher. What happens is, is that the career path then gets a focus, gets a zone in, and then you and I can come in as the educators and be like, yo, boom, here's the path to that, yeah, right? This, this, and, yeah, man. I like so that. So that's what I'm saying. So I, 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 I get it. I know why they say that. You could be whatever you want to be, but uh, if, you, if, you're scared, if you're afraid of heights, you're not going to be a roofer. Like, that's just not going to, you know, so, right. you know, so those are just the conversations that I think we have to continue to have with our youth and, um, and also allow them and understand as educators that like 14, 13, 14, 15, they ain't don't know what it is, right? But you have to start identifying what I call transferable skills. What are your transferable skills? What are your skills you can take from who you are and what you do well now and put them into a career path where you'll make enough money and you'll be happy. So I like that, man. And that's definitely why I started the podcast. Like, because I talk a lot and pain, you know, Vincent told me, Hey man, Mike talks a lot too. You know what I mean? So I talk a lot <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, you know, my mom always just 
you should do this in sport. And I never took the path to maybe even try to do communications or whatever. But now I look back, man, if I would have done communications, bro, I'd be on the news already. Or I'd be, yeah. I'd have my own media come. And so it's like, you know what? It's okay. I got my path. Now I want to kind of, you know, see what I can do with this podcast, see where this takes me. And honestly, this, this opened some doors for me, man. Like when you, you know, you and I are talking, you yeah. know, I, I've been able to talk to people from Oregon, Illinois, you know, we're all over the place right now. And I'm, I'm reaching out to people everywhere. And it's a cool little tool that I'm using. I'm, you know, using the internet for the good. And, and maybe one day there's an opportunity to start my own media company or, or yeah. you know, or even be somewhere, you know, whatever. So either way, this is what I'm doing. It, like you said, transferable skills and, you know, yeah. Okay. I want to be a professional baseball player, but I'm scared of a fastball. You know, it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? So that is something that stopped me from playing baseball was, man, they pitch too fast. You know, like, okay, you know, this is not my thing. I'm going to stick to soccer, you know? And so, but, but, you know, so, so kind of speaking of that, I was, I was thinking about when you were talking about, you, you know, you can do whatever you want. You know, at the end of the day as well, though, um, you got to want to be there, you know, and not be money driven either, you know, because I feel like a lot of times they want to, people want to be a rapper or whatever kind of, you know, celebrity, but it's not because they like doing that. I think they just see the life that they see on TV or on Instagram. You know, you're sitting on top of the Lambo and you got, you know, blue faces in your hand. You got a stack of blue faces, right? I barely learned what blue cheese meant the other day. I had to ask my friend what blue cheese meant. And so you got stacks of blue faces, yeah. right? And, and then you got the phone and, you, and, you, and you know, so I, you see that sometimes and you're like, okay, that's why the kids want to do that. You know, I know that's why, you know, because we all wanted to be Dr. Dre as kids. We all wanted to have that, you know, lifestyle. They're just chilling, kicking it. And, uh, 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 you know, who doesn't want to do that? But if that's not your drive and you don't want to put the work in the studio, or like you said, you don't know the ins and outs of the business, that could be a path you don't want to take. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's funny because you the, the stack of blue faces because you're a a, a uh, an artist or an athlete is taxed at fifty five percent. So <laughs> take that stack of blue faces and cut it in half. Rip them in half. Uncle Sam, yeah, give Uncle Sam his fifty, right? <laughs> See, that's the thing. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's kind of a process of learned, right? That's why it's like you know I'd rather be the guy on the back end who goes, you know what? Let's negotiate this deal for this. Right, so we can guarantee that you can you continue to, to uh, 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 keep your ownership of what it is is going to you know keep your residual money coming in, right? And that's what they don't understand. These artists, that's why they go broke, because yeah, it looks good, and so you've been advanced six hundred thousand dollars, which is going to be taxed at three hundred thousand dollars, which means now you only got one hundred fifty five to spend out of that six. So they don't tell you that story, right? They're oh. just a stack of blue faces, or they don't tell you a story about how after the video shoot, that black that stack of blue faces is gonna go back into a bag, which is gonna be handed right back over to the, the person who owns the label and gonna be put right back in the bank. That's just a prop. You can go on Amazon right now and look at prop money. They have it all day. You can order the blue stick all day, you can order that, right? So um those are some of the conversations that we have to have with our youth because they're going to be inspired about what they see. They're going to be inspired by what they see, right? And they're going to be inspired by what they hear. And they're going to be inspired by ultimately what they feel behind what they see and they hear. And what they see and they hear is the quick way to get out is to become, you know what I'm saying, whatever it is. And um, the story behind it is not told. And so that's what we got to get good at. And it is, and it all goes back to what I talked about with uh, with Vincent about you know Black Money You. He wants us to do this whole thing with his podcast, talking about financial literacy to uh, kids of color, you know. And and I think that's a huge thing that we got to teach because we don't we never talk about you know how to buy a house or, or you know how to invest your money or whatever it may be. Or like you said, you don't, you don't know about the taxes behind all these things. So there, and, and that's why I want to give a shout out to Amobi Akugo, uh, who came on my podcast as well. Who's a uh, Niger- he's a firstborn American, you know, generation of a Nigerian parents. And, you know, he plays professional soccer. He was a number, you know, number six overall draft MLS. You know, he's from Sacramento as well. And he's on the podcast and he has a whole thing called frugal athlete. You got to check it out. And so what he does is he actually does a consultation and workshop seminars to professional athletes talking about how to invest their money. And obviously he's he's looking at, you know, his big group of people he's looking at is obviously black athletes, you know, and and teaching them how, you know, because he, he said he got inspired by watching that that ESPN, you know, documentary, you know, uh, going broke, broke, whatever it was called, whatever. Broke. Yeah, broke. broke. And um, this whole thing where like, broke. you know, we see these athletes and they're making millions, but they don't realize the back end of it where they're getting taxed, they're losing their money, they're blowing their money every week 
whatever may be there. Like you said, they're leasing a Lambo. It's like, hey, man, like, no, right? And so there's an image that, that people want to uphold. But a lot of times, you know, especially like if, if these kids don't have someone at home teaching them that, or maybe their parents don't mm -hmm. have that financial literacy, understanding of how things work, you mm -hmm. know, we have to find somewhere where we can teach them that. Like, hey, man, you know, a lot of times we go for these jobs and it sounds good. But is it really, you know, worth your time? You know, are, are you really getting paid with your worth? Or, you know, when you do get your check, what are you doing with it? You know what I mean? Do you really yeah. need to have the newest iPhone today? You know, do, today. You, really need, do you really need to go buy the breads or, or, or the, the Space Jam 11? Whatever. Do you really need to go do that? Is that something you need to do? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> is that something you need? Like, is that, you know, I always tell the kids, they have the shoes. I go, are you going to eat those shoes or what? And they're right. like, and they're right. like, what you mean? I'm like, are you going to eat them? Because I would never spend $200, $300 on a pair of shoes, bro. You know how much food I can eat with that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know where I can go with $200? Man. <laughs> Let me turn this light on real quick. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, no. You're 100% you're, you're one, you're right, man. And it's kind of like, um, yeah, you can't. I, I just don't, you know, it's it's funny, though, because it's kind of like $200 for some kicks, you know. And so it, it, that brings me to a point, and, and Vince and I always talk about is appreciation versus de depreciation, right? So you buy the shoes for $200. As soon as you walk out the store, they're only worth 40. So, and let's go back to the fact that it took $2.35 to make them. So, you know, you, you talk about, um, there, there's terminology we can use in there, right? So appreciation, depreciation, um, you could talk about uh, up pricing, right? How that, 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 what's the term where you, you price something up to 200, 300 times. I mean, and and how, uh, uh, you know, you, you can't get caught in that. And I think you made a really, really good point about wants and needs, mm -hmm. right? Wants and needs, you know? you know, And so, um, and you got to know the difference between those two. There's a quote, uh, and that, that broke documentary is amazing. I watched that, and those guys are telling stories. And I remember those, those guys played during the time that I watched. You know right. what I'm saying? And, and I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, these guys got millionaires. These guys are millionaires. And then to see them on that documentary, right. it's like, wow. You know, like, wow, I, didn't, I, ne I never knew. So um, I never understood why schools don't have a financial literacy class. You know, let's, I've never used A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But I have had to balance a checkbook, right? I have had hey, to. You, you, never know, had, you never had a solve for, for slope? <laughs> no, for slope. I've never had to solve for slope or P, or P hat or any of that stuff. Right. That, that, but, comes, back, that comes back to what we talked about with the, you know, the curriculum. It, it's, it's, it's always evolving. I think like maybe when the things we're teaching now is something we needed, maybe when we were in school and the kid, the things the kids need now, we're probably not going to give it to them until probably 10 years down the road to a new generation. You know, it just, it's slow. It's slow the way it, it works. Yeah. And, and you are right. We do need to put that in the classroom somehow because you know, a lot of times, like you said, that want and need is blurred by what they see. And it goes back to the social media, man. There's a social media thing they see where it's like, I got to be doing this or I'm doing nothing. And it's like, no, 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 that's not how it works. You know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, we look at it and we're like, no, 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 you know, okay, this kid wants to be a barber, right? And I go back to the barbers all the time. because I know you mentioned the barbers earlier and I have a little joke that I run with my friends about it. And it's like, because when I go to the barbershop, I haven't been treated well, you know, many very different times. And I'm like, and I look at it and I'm kind of like, these guys don't want to make money, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm sitting here and you guys are joking around and talking about right. he'll, he'll take you. It's like, bro, I'm, I'm trying to give you 25, whatever mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. which I already think it's a little too much sometimes too. Right. But I'm right. like, can you cut me? Oh, no, bro. I got someone coming. And they, they don't have someone coming for like, you're there for an hour, two hours sometimes. Like I had an appointment. Why does this guy keep coming in and sitting down? You know, it, and so a lot of times I'm looking at it, it's like, Man, are these barbers really trying to make money, or are they just trying to kick it? Because I, I feel like sometimes some of these yeah. guys that I know, they're not trying to make. They're not trying to make money. They're just trying to be in this lifestyle. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that's a good point. So some people get into what they get into for the lifestyle, and that's what we see a lot of times with uh, these youngsters now, right? They're getting these gangs and getting this stuff. They're in it for the lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? They're not in it for real. When I grew up, I man, the gangsters was the gangsters. You know, like uh, they they moved in silence. It was a it was a fraternity that was, you know, it was invite only, you know, now everybody can be a gangster, right? So that means you can get into it for the lifestyle. It's sad that those barbers are like that because, you know, barbers, especially in the black community, 
they serve a lot of times as our doctors, you know, back in the day. That's what that red, white, and blue, you know, uh, 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 sign is. That okay. was, they had salves. So if you had a burn or you had a rash, or if you had, those were the guys you went to to see, right? They weren't just about cutting hair, about styling hair. They were, you went there for your mental health. That's why my initiative is back in, a, putting it back in the barbershops, putting the onus on them. You know, my thing is too is, you know, and that's why the barbers that I, I do utilize, they will have to have customer service skills because that's something that they don't teach in barbering school, right? It's customer service skills. Yeah. I'm there to purchase your service. I should be serviced the way I need to be serviced. If not, I'm not coming back. I'm not, you. Hey, he gonna take you. I didn't come here for him to take me. I came here for you to cut my hair. Yeah. And if, if you can't do that, you either need to say, hey man, can I reschedule something? But don't shuffle me off, right? Yeah. And so that's something else we need to, to think about uh, uh, another class, right? Is we need a whole class <laughs> on customer service. Because yeah, yeah. it ain't just barbershops. It's a lot of places, yes, you know? And, that, and that's just what it is. It's kind of like when you're in front of, and that goes back to a public speaking course maybe, right? A public speaking course and, and, and being able to provide more of those. Those to me are applicable skills. Those to me are transferable skills that you can build upon that you'll need in everyday life. You need those customer service skills. You need those speaking skills. And for a barber not to have that, that's kind of, that's problematic, you know? So we ain't gonna name the barbershop. We ain't gonna do that. But we just gonna say barbers, if you're listening to this, come on, man, you know? We're trying to, yeah. the way I see it too is, is you wanna be, you know, you wanna be professional. We hear that a lot anywhere we work. Oh, thanks for being professional, whatever it may be. But there, there's an image that you have to hold a little bit. You know, a lot of us want to say, oh, I can do whatever I want. It's like, you can, you know, but, you know, nowadays anyone has a phone and anyone could be filming you, you know, and you see videos come up <laughs> and you're like, is that person really going to call that person something like that when they know people are filming? Like, what's wrong with, you know, so and the old time I kind of clicked because I, I, you know, I played soccer my whole life and, and I would get into altercations a lot, you know, later on in my career. And my mom would tell me like, hey, you know, people have phones now, you know, they're, you know, you yeah. don't want to be that no guy that's, that's doing it. And, and thank God I was able to not be filmed ever in any kind of altercation or conversation or argument. But now it's like, now you got to be careful, man. You know, and you got to know. Oh, yeah. And not just being oh, careful, yeah. but it's also about, you know, like you said, leaving that legacy. Like, you, you know, my dad used to say, when you leave the house, son, like you have my last name. So everyone knows you know, who your dad is, you know, so yeah. you are. And I have my dad's name. Right. So I have yeah. his full name. So, yeah. you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a second, you know, so it's like you're not going to walk around doing these crazy things and i have to answer to this you know what i mean i'm an educator i work in these places in these institutions people know who i am you know my dad had a a high uh, position at, at a district and it's like hey, you're not going to be i'm not going to answer to this you know what i mean so you know when you walk out of this door and you know, you're representing me you know so make sure what you're doing what i do this you know what i mean so mm -hmm. like, and, and I mean, you know and i have a dad so a lot of people don't have that to tell them that you know but that's why we have to be man, that person for man ain't, ain't it ain't it tough being the second man it's so tough. I'm the second, man. And oh, man, everybody knows my pops, man. Uh, and, and, and they know him for the right reasons, right? Exactly. They know him because he's a good dude, you know? And so I, I'm not even going to say that it's pressure, right? It's a privilege, let me say, Correct. to share the same full name, right, with someone who, who left a legacy. And so going back to your question of why, you know, you and I, it, 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 it's, they left the legacy and now it's our turn to take the baton and leave the legacy too. And my dad, he does not play with the last name. He'd be first and foremost, he'd be like, nope. You didn't. When I was little, he used to be, you didn't put in on this. You didn't put in on this yet. <laughs> so you, you just, he's like, you just borrowing the last name right now. You need to work your way up to yeah. earn the full right, you know, to use that Benjamin moniker wherever you go, you know. And we look at it like a crest, right? Like a royal crest. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's your, and so, you know, that brings me to, you know, a, a connectedness that sometimes gets lost nowadays, right? People aren't really attached to, you know, from whence they came sometimes. And um, the problem. name means a lot, man. The name means a lot in this. And, and even, you know, the school names, right? That, that means a lot. You know, you, you, you educated, you at the school. This is whatever this school is called. This is our way of doing things. You represent us. Yes. It needs to be right. You know I mean? so, it has to be that you know i think that's something from our generation where you know like what well, you say you represent your family you 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 love the school you go to it doesn't matter what it was that was your school you know you went to sack high you went to, i went to the thomas 
and nobody yeah. was going to come to the Thomas and do nothing around here, not in our field, you know? So <laughs> it, it was something that you had like mm. as a pride thing. Now yeah. it's, a, it's a shifted a little bit, you know, cause even with, you know, professional sports, you and I, you know, you got your team and you roll with your team. I, if that, the second that guy leaves my team, I don't care about him no more. You know what I mean? Yeah. But now there's like this whole shift of like individualism, individualism where a yes. guy can, you know, oh no, I just, I just love LeBron. It's like, bro, he's been on so many, what do you mean? Love LeBron? What team do you like? No, I like the Lakers now. No, you don't like the Lakers now, bro. You can't like the Lakers now. You know what I mean? Like you, yeah. how can you, you switch your teams like this? So I think it's changed. And so what happens, I see that too. Like we had a conversation with, with students sometimes like, I want to go to that high school. I'm like, but you don't go there, man. You go here. So let's, yes. let's, let's rock this spot right now. Oh no, but I want to play there. It's like, but why don't you just be the star here and carry this team on your back? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Where's that ownership? And then, so I try to teach that to my kids. Like, no, put that on your back and to carry it, man. Mm-hmm. Because everyone, you know, especially now the kids, they, they all want to be instant winners, right? But no one wants to put the work in. If I can, it, it, it's called the, the AAU mindset, right? That's what I call it. Yeah. The AAU mindset. Let's just right. build a team of stars. And we'll win. go out. We'll yeah. play. There, there, there'll be no chemistry, right? But everyone can score 30. And so we're bound to win. We got to win, right? And that's the same. It, it's a, it's kind of a weird herd mentality. You know what I'm saying? Where they just want to win. And yes. the, the ironic thing about it is, it's like you and I would have wanted to stay at whatever school we're at because why would I want to go play with eight other guys who are scoring 30 when I could stay here and be the guy, be the man to focus and put in work, you know? But, um, you know that that's kind of where we where we're at in terms of of a of work ethic. I think right is it's this it's really a microwave you know situation that we're in, and 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 that includes some adults. That includes some cats my age too that want to now just push button right, click a mouse. And <laughs> but um, I read a quote the other day. It's like if you if you're not willing to put the work in, you might as well forget about the money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're not willing to put the work in, I mean, what you, what do you even you know, uh, uh, my favorite MC, Rock Kim, said, you know, he don't like to dream about getting paid. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's what it is. You know what I'm saying? You don't like to dream about and, and matter of fact, the, in that Broke documentary, my favorite quote ever, right? My second favorite quote ever. Herman Edwards said, a goal without a plan is just a wish. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yo, it like hit me. A goal without a plan is just a wish. Right. So what happens is, People, a lot of times, they wish they were successful. They wish they could get to this place. They wish they looked like this. They wish they could jump like this, right? right? And if their goal is to do that, they have to have a plan. And people, you know, people ain't planning. So they're just wishing. And that's why it doesn't come to fruition a lot of times. And I think, obviously, the internet has given people that perspective where a kid will go onto YouTube, right? See a kid, you know, dunking or whatever, do all these things. Like, oh, I want to get there. It's like, man, there's so much work behind that part. Like, so much like work. Said, like, Mazi, we could, we could look at where he's at today, but where was he before? He's not showing, he he wasn't able to show you when he was 12, right? And raps in a note, but we don't know what he was doing when he was 13, 14. You don't know. Like, you, you, you're just looking at the almost the finished product and kind of like obviously a part of the finished product, but you're not seeing the grind before that. And there's such so much sacrifice and work that goes into anything. You know, we, I'm a big fan of David Goggins. If you, you know, if you know who that is, but David oh, yeah. Goggins, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, like he said, there's no finish line. And so when I was trying to get back into shape, get into my better situation, I was like, all right, you know, a lot of people put a number. I want to be here. And it's like, no, but it doesn't, it shouldn't end at 32. Like you said, why should you, you not be able to hoop at 40? Who said you can't hoop at 40? Like who says you can't, you know, go, go run fives at 50. The, we we just see that because we see older guys that didn't take care of their bodies and they didn't make it anymore. But I mean, you'll see it. You see these professional athletes going pretty long if they just you know it's easier to stay in shape than to get in shape. You know, and a lot of these you know, so there's a lot of things that I that I kind of live by right now. And I try to tell the, the young generation coming up that I coach and that I teach. It's like, hey man, like first of all, you have a lot of life left, and mm-hmm. number two, like you say, if you if you if you don't have a plan to how you're going to get to that point, like you said, it's just a, it's just a wish at this moment. It's just a dream. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's funny because Goggins is a beast, man. And so, um, oh, man. It, it, in my head, I can still run fives, man. I can shoot that thing, man. In my head, <laughs> right? But I know to get my body there, I'm gonna have to put in a lot, a lot, a lot more work. But I understand that, right? And so, what happens is, is that it's hilarious, man. If you look at, and I know, you know, 
I, I, I always get into this GOAT debate about LeBron and this, that, and the other. But let me say this. At well, Jordan's 30, the GOAT, by the way. 30, uh-oh, uh-oh, see, see. Because that's, we, another, that's, another, that's another thing, too. I don't want me to cut you off, but the, the word GOAT is being used way too much now. But way too much, yeah, way ahead. too much. There's really, only, there's really only one GOAT. But uh, but um, I think what happens is, is that, um, you know, you look at, man, look at LeBron at his age, right? Mm-hmm. Look at Tom Brady. Right, look at these guys, man. You know, there's some baseball players at the big dudes of 45, 46, man. They're hitting, you know, and running and 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 like you said, it's a dedication to um, you know, them putting the time and the work in. Yeah. And like you said, I always I tell my son this all the time. He's a corner, he's a pretty good corner. Okay. But I'm like, yo, you know, you're looking at other corners. You every NFL corner is nice. Every NFL corner, they put the work in. They put, you know, they put the time in to watch tape. They run. They, they're not just instant nice, right? And I think what happens is that we live in the X button generation where they, they think they can pull the controller out and push X in it. It'll, nah, man. You know, yeah. people put in work. People put in work to get where they're at. And um, that's I think that's the messaging that we got to get back. You know, in terms of uh, and putting into our youth and, and in terms of leaving that legacy, man. Is is you know, we gotta start putting that back in. It, it takes, like you said, it's not it's, it's all this instant stuff, you know, instant everything, Instagram, instant everything, instant microwave, <laughs> whatever, instant popcorn, whatever, instant soup, and it's like all these little instant things. And and the issue with that is that, you know, like you said you forget the process before it, you know, and um, like you said, we can do what we can talk about with athletes, we can talk about with musicians, you can talk about with any, you can talk about with anybody, to be honest, a gardener, you know, what I mean, a construction work doesn't matter, time. You know, the only way to learn is, is, is through time and obviously working and, and, you know, having that patience to make mistakes or whatever it may be, you know, because I tell a lot of kids like hey, teaching was not my first thing. You know, I started kind of late in my in my years, you know, compared to other teachers. You know, I tried other things first. I was doing, you know, I had a business, you know, I, I tried working somewhere else and I was doing other things. And ev- eventually everything I did kind of always led me back to being a teacher, you know, because I was always coaching and, and doing these things. So you never know what your path will take you. At the end of the day, I don't think teaching is my, my, my finish line either. I really don't think it's my finish line. I think people would probably love to be in my situation where I'm at today, um, which is, which is, if it makes you feel good, but that's not my finish line. You know what I mean? I, I do want more. You know, I do have a lot, but I want more. Right. And, and, and I think that comes from the, from the ability to dream. You know, we can never lose that ability to dream. Mm-mm. You know, you can never, uh, uh, no. uh, you know, you can't you lose that ability. And so that I, I'm really on the youngsters about that. My dreams yeah. are all right here, man. I've been writing. There you go. I've been writing. <laughs> I've been yeah. writing uh, dreams like every day. I'll, if I get an idea, I'm like, because because a goal without a plan is just a wish. It's a wish. So you got to put that thing down because it helps you manifest it, right? It helps you, you know, you put it down. I'm 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 sure our generation, man. I have so many notebooks full of. And the, the odd thing is, I can always go back to them and be like, oh, I remember when I. You know, you, it's almost like a dream catcher, a notebook. I encourage all kids, I'm like, yo, get you notebooks and keep capture your thoughts, right? They're like, they're like fireflies. You got to capture them in that jar, yes. you know, and keep yes. them lit because that's, um, you know, that's where it'll be the most. And the thing about, because my son, they're, they're, you know, the kids, they're so technologically advanced. They're like, oh, I'll put it in my notes. Right. I'm like, nah, mm-hmm. nah, take the notebook out and write it. Because the, the pen, when you write, it's an antenna to God, right? It's an antenna. God looking down on that antenna and bloop, putting that energy in it. Can't do that in a note. Is, write it down. Isn't there something? I don't know about you, too. I mean, my mom was a teacher. She was a, she was a kid. She's retired as well. My dad was an educator. And we always had stuff at the house. But isn't it something to you? I don't know about you, but when I see a fresh, brand new note, notebook oh, and, man. and a sharpened pencil, for some reason, it just brings this, it's this like, it brings this feeling like going back to when you were a little kid learning how to write your name and all that. Like it really brings that, like, you know, seeing that there's a hundred pages that I could fill and don't get me wrong. I don't think I've ever filled the notebook, right? You, you always like start one and you lose it or you start when you put it away, but, but something about a brand new notebook. Right. And, hey. and, and that was like for college, I would put myself up by going to the store and buying myself the new notebooks for the, for the, the semester and getting some of those, those nice mechanical pencils, the ones you're going to lose anyways, and, you know, end up using something else later on. But 
it was something about that first day where you just put that on paper and you're starting to write your notes, you know, and as you go on, it gets sloppier, but that first day, right? Is there a feeling of like, wow, you know, this is endless possibilities mm -hmm. right here. It's like a fresh, it's like a fresh pair of Air Force Ones, baby. You can't you get that notebook, you, you open that thing up. Because I think what it is, is it, it symbolizes a new start, a fresh new start, yes. right? In this notebook, even though I got seven over there, but in this one, oh, I'm about to put it down. And then you have all these things right here and here, yeah. and, and and it's somehow you say you're you're bringing it out of you and you're putting it on paper, which is it's it's a strong thing, man. It's a strong, it's a strong. Oh man, it's, it's I don't know. I get like I'm thinking about it right now. And today I was telling the kids, hey, write this down. I'm giving them a packet. I'm like, write it down. Oh, can I just put it in the computer? I'm like, I'm like, no, but write your notes down on paper, man. You know what I mean? Like write it on paper. It's just something to me about a paper and a pencil, man. Yeah, no, it makes all the difference in the world, man. All the difference. So, so anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, man. I don't take too much of your time and, and get back to our busy lives. But I appreciate you, like, man, jumping on. I feel like we can go for hours. And I hope we yeah. can reconnect soon. And, yeah. you know, we can help each other out whatever project we're working on, man. Hey, man, you know, whatever space and place and time you need me, man, let me know, man. It sounds good, man. I appreciate your I appreciate time. Let, them know, let the people know where they can find you, man. Hey, listen, Mike B. Gives Back at IG and Michael Benjamin the second, I believe, on Facebook. So... Um, look out for Sula, um, Sacramento Urban Learning Academy, and look out for Fades for Grades, right? Uh, Mental Health Initiative. And big shout out to the Confess Project, too. So I'm going to collab with uh, this national organization called the Confess Project, the adult, Lorenzo Lewis. Um, it's dope, man. Check it out. So the key is to, 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 to create more safe spaces for mental health, for young men of color, and, 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 and black boys and brown boys and, and black girls and brown girls. And, you know, so we're going to get be everywhere, man. We're going to be everywhere creating better communities uh, and better spaces, man. That's it. I appreciate you, man. You, you heard it. And I'll share it all over my notes. I'll be, I'll be blasting it. But yeah, Mike B gives back, man. So I appreciate you, Mike. Have a good night, man. I appreciate you. Peace, brother. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you.